Good day, friends. I'm Kerry Dillinger. This is Bible Class Topics. It's a topical study. What are you worth? We're going to start by taking a look at Hebrews 2, verses 5 through 9, and Psalm 8, 3 through 4. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control at present. We do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Then the psalmist says this, When I look at your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? All things then have value. Think about our economy. Our economy is based on our ability to determine the value of most commodities such as gold, stocks, cattle and grain, real estate, etc. That which is prized the most becomes the standard by which the value of other things are established. For many years our economy in this country was on a gold standard now the world wants dollars, currency, bitcoin, stocks, bonds, etc. In the future, we don't know what the standard will be. The standard may be something else. The value of things changes. In the 70s, oil was high because it was scarce. Gasoline prices are up now because demand is high. Add to that the effects of the pandemic, the war in Ukraine, and other factors, and we see that the value of even gasoline changes day to day, month to month, year to year. And when the economy changes, everything is affected. A gallon of milk, a postage stamp. All things then do have value. You have value. I have value. According to the U.S. Bureau of Chemistry and Soils, the human body consists of the following materials in these approximate proportions. 65% oxygen. 18% carbon, 10% hydrogen, 3% nitrogen, 1.5% calcium, 1.2% phosphorus, less than a percent of potassium, a quarter of a percent of sulfur, even less sodium, chlorine, magnesium, and a touch of iodine. Additionally, it's discovered that our bodies contain trace amounts of fluorine, silicon, manganese, zinc, copper, aluminum, and even arsenic. Together, all the above amounts to less than about a dollar's worth. Our most valuable asset, then, is our skin. Cut and dried, the average person is a proud owner of 14 to 18 square feet of skin, and basing the value of skin on the selling price of cowhide, which in the early 2000s was approximately 25 cents per square foot, the value of the average person's skin is around $3.50. So in U.S. dollars, we're worth about 5 bucks. However, your worth from an economic perspective is greater. Most of us have life insurance, which is based on what we would expect to earn over the years from when we purchased the insurance till the expected death. 
because of an unexpected death. Corporations insure their executives against death because of what they know and could earn for the company, much like car insurance. Thus, at any moment, you are worth more dead than you are alive. If you're healthy, your individual organs may have some monetary value. According to Gary Becker, an American economist and a Nobel laureate, if the sale of human organs for transplantation were allowed, a kidney would be worth about $15,000 and a liver would go for about $35,000. Becker published this information in January of 2006. In 1983, a Virginia company headed by H. Barry Jacobs announced the first scheme to buy and sell human organs. Under his proposed arrangement, a healthy, live, ostensible donor would set a price for a kidney up to $10,000, and the recipient would pay this amount plus two to $5,000 to broker a commission with Jacobs. However, given these considerations, we live in a time when that which ought to be prized the most is prized the least. It is still true today that life is cheap. To the evolutionist, uh, we're a further development. To the materialist, uh, we're like the little dog Rover. To the ecologist, we're a destabilizing influence on the environment. To the industrialist, we're just a cog in a big machine. To the militarist, we're a fighting animal. To the government, we're a taxpayer ID number. To the abortionist, we're a mass of tissue. To the euthanist, we're something that needs to be put out of its misery. However you value your life and, how, and your value is not determined then by your essential material elements and your value is not determined by the prevailing philosophies of the day, your actual worth is determined by him who created you in the first place. Most of what we buy and sell are manufactured goods, raw materials transformed by a process that that process then has even additional value. For example, wheat, milk, and eggs become bread. The value of those products is set by the manufacturer in whatever the market conditions allow. Meanwhile, man is the creation of God's hands, as we could read in Genesis 2.7. There will be quite a few scriptures in this lesson today, and the ones that I've underlined I'm going to leave to you to check out. God determines the worth. He is the creator. He determines the worth. He is the one who has purchased man, so he decides what he is willing to give for man. That was a long introduction. Now let's get into our discussion and lesson at hand. Let's go back to our original readings, both from the psalm and from Hebrews. What is man that you are mindful of him? Well, man is a living soul made in the image of an eternal God. When we see the word life in Genesis 2-7, it's a plural in the Hebrew, and it literally means breath of lives. God breathed into humanity that which constituted him as a living soul. Genesis 2-7, and see also Genesis 1-20, and also 1-30. However, God also breathed into him that which made him in the image of God. Genesis 1-26 and 27. Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over the creeping things that creep on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Hebrews 12:9. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not so much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? And in John 4, 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Man is 
like the animals in that he, like they, have life. Genesis 1.30 and Genesis 2.7. However, there is that in man which is in the image of God. It's a spirit, as we just read in John 4.24. Scripture itself distinguishes between man and the animals. Let's take a reading from Ecclesiastes 3, 19 through 21. For what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beast is the same as one dies, so the other dies. They all have the same breath, and man has no advantage over the beast, for all is vanity. All go to one place, all are from the dust, and to the dust all returns. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward? and the spirit of the beast goes down into the earth. It is this distinction between the spirit of the man and the spirit of the beast that elevates man above the animals, giving man dominion over the animals. Man is body and soul, flesh and spirit, having both an inner and an outer man. The word soul and spirit are sometimes used interchangeably in the Bible. See 1 Samuel 1.15 and Job 7.11. The word soul may sometimes refer to the flesh, as in 1 Peter 3.20, Genesis 12.5, and Exodus 1.5. The word soul and spirit may, however, be used distinctly from one another and the flesh. Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. In 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Paul the Apostle said, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. While this may be confusing and difficult to understand and may cause us to have to study more diligently on this subject, there is a definite duality to man taught in the scriptures. The body or flesh is the house or tent where the spirit and soul dwells. 2 Peter 1, 4, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus made it clear to me. There's a longer reading that you probably would need to take, and that's from 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 9. Our personality, our will, and desires are associated then with the inner man, namely the spirit, 1 Corinthians 9, 27. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others I myself should be disqualified. Then in 2 Corinthians, Paul says this in chapter 5, verses 2 through 4, For in this tent we groan, longing to be put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked, for while we are still in this tent we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we further clothe, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. You can also see what Peter has to say about this in 2 Peter 1, verses 12 through 16. The inner man, then, will survive the outer man in death. 2 Corinthians 4, 16. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. James, the Lord's brother, said this in chapter 2, verse 26 of his short letter. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Jesus said this in Matthew 10, 28, And do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. In Luke 23, 46, Jesus calling out with a loud voice says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. The wise man wrote in Ecclesiastes 12, 7, And the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. And in Genesis 3, 19, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to the dust you will return. In the reading we took at the beginning of this lesson, 
we see that as an order of being, man is a little lower than the angels. Psalm 8, 5 and Hebrews 2, 4 through 9. What does that mean, being a little lower than the angels? Well, it means our fleshly nature. It means the potentiality of redemption. It means our mortality. I'll leave all of these verses for you to study. You could pause here and take a screenshot or copy these scriptures down into your notes. What then is man worth? He's worth more than the sparrows. He's worth more than the sheep. He's worth more than an ox or a donkey. He's worth more than the world's combined wealth. However, God declared the exact value of man on Calvary. Man is so valuable to God that he's willing to let he was willing to let his only begotten son die for us. We all know John 3:16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. Romans 5, 8 through 10, But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. In 1 John 4, 9 and 10, In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him in this love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be a propitiation for our sins. God's own Son, then, is the price that God was willing to give. Acts 20, 28. Paul was warning the Ephesian elders to be careful. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained, how? With his own blood. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, Paul also wrote, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Since the value, then, of any commodity is determined by what men are willing to pay, we get some idea, then, of what worth man is to our Heavenly Father and Creator, the God in Heaven. All things have value. You and I have value to the God of Heaven. We're worth more than the birds. We're worth more than the sheep. We're worth more than any beast of burden. We are worth more than the combined wealth of the world. We have this value because we are made in the image of God. We have an immortal soul. We've been marred by sin, and our souls are in jeopardy, but Jesus has paid the price that will redeem us from loss. Thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. Jeff Asher posted this sermon outline at expositorysermonoutlines.com and left it there to be shared. The photo we use of the gold bars today is a stock photo that was uploaded to Pexels by Pixabay, and thanks to those folks for allowing the use of their photo. Also, if you need to get a hold of me privately, BibleClassTopics at gmail.com. And finally, thanks to everyone who tuned in today to study with me. I hope this lesson has been a benefit to you and that you can think on the fact that regardless of what the world puts prices on and how they determine what's worth what. We are always worth everything to God, our Heavenly Father. Let's pray for one another. 
And until we meet again, may God bless.